Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Step Zen workshop, not stream. Uh, we are Anthony and Lucia here to show you some uh, Step Zen studio stuff. Um, thank you all for being here. How are you doing today, Lucia? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm happy to be entering the new year and to be showing off the studio on it. I'm excited to see uh, what we've got cooked up today. So. Yeah. Happy 2022, everybody. Be reminding ourselves to say that year correctly throughout the rest of the month, and then it'll be smooth sailing from there, right? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully everybody remembered to update the copyrights to the bottom of your website. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. So we've done a couple of these workshops already. You did one previously. You want to talk a little bit about what you did in our last workshop? Yeah, so I showed how you can build a custom portfolio website generator. So um, the first part of the workshop, we looked at using the GraphQL studio to kind of marshal three different background, backends. We used Dev2, Twitter, and GitHub. Um, and then once we had those collected into one schema, we were able to make a dynamic portfolio site. I then borrowed um, some ideas about architecture from Cassidy Williams over at Netlify. She shows you how you can make a um, kind of like a link tree generator, um, but it was static. So I used steps in to insert a dynamic quality to it so that we could, um, anytime you updated, say a tweet, your top tweet on Twitter that was showed up in your portfolio site, it would um, automatically update. And that, you know, was available in portfolio site, but with the generator, you could uh, just click a button, enter a few pieces of information, and then have a, um, a dynamic portfolio site generated for you. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. It's a good example of what you can do with the studio because it's a really powerful tool and it gives you a lot of built-in capabilities and also gives you the ability to extend those capabilities. And so we're going to be showing today how you can use it to first start connecting different APIs together into like one kind of graph that you can then query. And then we're going to uh, like pop it out into like a project and then we can start editing and then we can add additional steps and directives to then start like linking queries together and doing things like that. And we're going to be using two APIs. We're going to be also using the, the Dev2 API. And then we're also going to be using the Google um, Cloud Natural Language API. And so this is an API that allows you to do what's called like natural language processing, NLP. So if you've ever heard the term like sentiment analysis, uh, it's stuff like that. So sentiment analysis is you take a... Uh, text like either words or sentences or phrases or even like whole paragraphs and you feed them into this algorithm and it gives you a polarity score which means it's like how positive or negative is this text so if you imagine you know you want to look at reviews and you can see like you know positive reviews get high get a high score and negative reviews get a low score so that's kind of the idea here. So we'll be looking at things like how do you pull in your, your blog comments and then feed it in to get that sort of sentiment analysis on it. I appreciate that description of the polarity score. Cause sometimes when I send requests to sentiment analysis APIs and I get the response back, I see like a number. I'm like, okay, so what does that mean? But, oh, you know, and I have to go digging mm -hmm. through all the docs. And it's good to know that we've got a negative and a positive uh, meaning attached to the number here. So. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh, especially nice because you can kind of like just test it out and like type phrases or words that, like you would expect to be like uh, highly positive or highly negative and kind of see what comes back. So that'll be some of the first things we'll be doing. So I'm going to share my screen. Let me just get everything situated here. That. All right, cool. So the first thing um, I want to show is that there is a blog post that will have a lot of what we'll be showing here. So this is um, analyze sentiment of your blog comments. And then this will show you how to get set up with the studio and it will show a lot of the queries that we're going to be going over in this example. 
And to get to the studio, you should do graphql.stepzen.com. And then this will take you to the studio here. So the studio has a lot of already built-in schemas for us to use over here. And I think there's about 40 of them here. And there's lots of really popular, well-known APIs for Yelp and Spotify, Twitter, and then you know, like example ones like SpaceX or the Pokemon API and JSON placeholder API. And then you can also get you know weather and location and all sorts of stuff here. We also have some combinations. And um, you've worked on some of these combinations, I believe, Lucia. Yes, yeah, including the developer publishing pack, which I used in the project that I was discussing earlier. Um, so that was that was kind of a, a fun thing to do. It's also fun to see, kind of scroll through the APIs they just showed and dream up combinations like, ooh, we've got Yelp reviews and Socrata. Could we do like, what's the uh, permit status of this restaurant? Um, kind of a kind of a, a request, you know, given all these all these different combinations. Yeah, and so we will not be using the combinations. We'll be building up kind of our own right. combination here. And the first thing you do is you just pick the one that you want to use, and then you hit add, and then it will ask you to configure it. I think it might already have my keys in from before. So if you are coming at this for the first time, then it will ask you for your keys and then you can input your keys and then it will cache those and keep them there. And they're just yeah. storing it in your browser's local storage. We're not holding onto the keys for you. So if you're you know, security minded, just know that steps in, has your back there. And that's something that we're thinking about here. We're not just taking these keys and then dumping them in a database and plain text somewhere. You right. know? Another thing I like to let folks know when I'm walking them through the studio at this point is that you don't need to use like the basic or API key keywords in front of your key when you're copy and pasting it and Stepson has that taken care of for you. And then there's a couple things here. You can write queries here. You can check out the schema as well. And you can look at documentation over here. And so as we were kind of talking about with the, the sentiment, that's what we're going to be doing here. This query is Google natural language under and then analyze sentiment all these are kind of prefixed with like what the thing is because if you're going to be bringing in uh different apis there may be like name collisions like if you have like a get users query you know like you'd be getting users from like half of these things so that's why they're all prefixed like that and then if you run this we will see that we're getting a very high positive score here because we're saying i feel happy which is a very positive phrase Right, However, where one if, is the highest, right? Yeah, and then we can see now if we do sad, we get the same number, but then negative. So it's a like negative one to positive one range. And then I think you can also get the magnitude, which is like how happy, how much in that direction is it? So I feel sad is both negative, but it's like strongly negative versus I feel happy would be both uh, positive and then strongly positive. Yeah. You know what then, an interesting use mm -hmm. case for this would be? Like if you were yeah. in taking patients and you had like a pain score, it'd be interesting mm. to an analyze the sentiments and see how negative uh, their response was. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. And then if you try and, I would find it's interesting, you try and trick it. It's like, I feel mm -hmm. neutral. So that's closer to the middle, still a little bit positive. And if I you feel. Have one zero, right? exactly in the middle and we get 0.5 so that's like okay. exactly in the middle but still kind of positive um but i feel zero i feel <laughs> no, zero so feeling good. like a zero would probably be a bad thing so that yeah. i think that makes sense to me yes yeah. yeah let's see um this demo is super awesome yeah see if it recognizes exclamation points no this demo is super awful yeah so we can see that it's a uh, seems to be at least you know going with what we would kind of naturally expect to get back for like you know human readable text and like uh give it kind of a smell test and so this is because like we're using you know google's apis and google has probably the most sophisticated language apis around most sophisticated machine learning apis around because they've been 
big proponents of things like TensorFlow and these open source libraries that they've been building up and they have you know, more data than almost anyone. So the way that these algorithms are kind of created is you have like a huge corpus of text that can, and you have like words that are labeled and phrases and sentences that are labeled positive or negative. And then they can, the machines can run through that text and like learn from it based on the labels, of like what humans have told it the text is like positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And then with enough of that text, it eventually kind of learns the patterns of like what is positive or negative. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I think I had a couple other queries over here that I wanted to show. I had one. So there's like, you can also analyze entities. So with this one, we can take a look at um, the basically like, what is the content about? So if we do that and this, and then we're gonna get the entities name and salience. Yeah, so here what I'm doing is I'm taking a snippet of text from one of my blogs. This example contains two separate repositories, one for the Redwood API, another for the next front end. And then over here, it's recognizing the entities and then giving us a salience score. So we see here things like uh, example gets uh, 0.5, but then just like kind of uh, words that aren't really that important, like one has 0.1 and one and two of those have zero. Okay, just to, then, to back it up a little bit to understand, an entity is yeah. like a word? So an entity is sentence? like a kind of an, yeah, so it's, this is kind of NLP kind of speak. So it's not just a word, it's kind of more like an idea. So like here we have like Redwood API is considered a single entity. And that's, okay. that is correct because you wouldn't separate both Redwood and API as like their own entities because we're talking about the Redwood API. It goes, it goes together. So an entity okay, is kind right. of like a, like just a thing, you know? Right, right. So mm -hmm. it would be any, any object you have and then any attributes of that object belong in the same entity. Yeah, some kind of like that. But then we have like one. So <laughs> mm -hmm. I put that still an entity. Okay, I think I think I get it. And how about salience? And then so salience is I think how important is the entity to understanding the the text itself. So when you do analysis, if you were to like run the first thing you usually do, like the most naive kind of way to do text analysis is to basically just take all of the words, separate them, and then count them and then see what words show up the most. And then if you do that, most of the words that show up the most, you're like, and, the, but, like words that don't really mean anything. So you want to find the words that are most important to the text, but those won't always be necessarily the words that show up the most just from a pure word count perspective. So we have examples of subject of the sentence, and it looks like it has the highest entity score on the screen that I can see. Or yeah, so, cool. yeah, yeah, and they're, they are able to, I think, take into account things like sentence structure and stuff like that. So I would imagine that's partly why that would show up really highly. AI and then so you can also do a uh, classify text. And so for this one, what it's going to do is it's going to take the entire text and then give us like words that kind of classify it. And so for this, um, taking the whole description, a longer description of the one that I was just doing, and this is a blog post that I wrote about integrating Redwood and Next.js, which are two like mm. JavaScript React kind of frameworks. And then, let's see. That's because I slightly changed this one. There we go. So yeah. now we're seeing that it can tell that this is a blog post about computers. <laughs> like this is this is pretty cool because it's, if you look at these terms, these terms are not anywhere in this this example here. We're not using the word computer or science or technology. Yeah, you or even anything. got the word punted so you could see like a really bad AI thinking this was about sports. <laughs> you know? Yeah, totally. Um, but this mm -hmm. is good, this is cool. Yeah, and then you also get a, a confidence score as well. And so it's saying that we feel fairly confident based on the text we've gotten that these are the categories that this fits in. I wonder if GitHub could have an AI that was similar to this, but analyze computer languages and projects and told you like 
how object oriented or functional, you know, certain project. Well, so, so, so Copilot is GitHub's kind right. of natural language thing. And um, that is using open AI, which is kind of like the closest competitor to the technology that Google has is, is open AI. Mm -hmm. they're, they're doing the same thing. They're doing like huge, massive deep learning experiments with like, you know, billions, if not trillions of, of data points of, of text. And so what they've done is they basically taken all of the code on GitHub, which includes both code and comments, and then run that through the algorithm. And that's how they're able to do like the copilot autocomplete. And so you can mm -hmm. do things like write a comment and then it'll suggest the code to go along with that comment. So any possible thing you can think about in terms of like text analysis and stuff on code, like that's kind of what you would be able to do with Copilot is going to continuously learn as more people use this and it's going to get better and better and better. You'll be able to do more and more kind of complicated things with it. Right. So that is the Google natural language API. Now we're going to connect the dev API. And so pretty sure I already have my keys in there. And so for this to start you off with a couple kind of pre-made queries already, which includes you, Lucia, you are the user Ooh, with the sorry. articles, I believe. Let's see. So if we check here, we can see some of the recent uh, posts that Lucia has written. And, uh, so we see things like step then posts and stubs versus mocks line between willingness to learn and shiny object syndrome. That sounds like a good one. It was, that was fun. And then all the way at the bottom, we can actually get our user info here. And if we wanted to get uh, my stuff, then we can just input instead of searchy, we're going to do AJC web dev. And so okay. here is my information. Yeah, summary, GitHub username, location, internet, and then my website for my podcast. And it's funny wanted... uh, that you put locations, mm -hmm. the internet. I don't know. It's... Yeah, I've always. It's kind of imagine where I imagine you living, but. <laughs> yeah, I kind of. <laughs> it's, it's true. I definitely live on the internet. Yeah, I kind of came from a a time when I think people were more hesitant to put their like location online or maybe people were more hesitant now. I, I don't really know. Yeah. I think in one of the first demos I did, I like had my IP address up there and it was a non-permanent demo. So as soon as I realized that I, I like took it down. So, mm -hmm. well, your IP address actually is one of the easiest things for people to find though. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. But it, it, it also like we use the IP address to get the address address. So. Ah, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's always fun. Kind of like when you're doing example stuff, like the information you put in, how much can you extrapolate off of that information? Sometimes it's more than you think. So over here now we are getting our dev two articles and we get things like the description, um, the cover image, the tags, the slug. And so this is a lot of the stuff that Lucia was showing with her example. But what if we wanted to be able to take our queries from dev and our queries from Google and sort of combine them. Because if we were to take the, the queries we were doing before and sort of put them in here, then we can run both of them at the same time. It is possible to do that. And so let's see, so let's do that. And then let's put this in. If we do this, we are able to run both of them at the same time because steps in automatically takes your different schemas and combines them all into like one mega schema that then you can query at the same time. But they're still like you want to think about, okay, but how do we like actually combine these things in a way where they can interop with each other? And that's where some of steps ends uh, custom directives come in because we're using some custom directives right now, like we're, if we go down to our queries here, we can see how these are actually set up. And the way they're set up is with the at rest directive. And so if we look at our um, get articles query, we have at rest, which then has the endpoint, 
And then the endpoint goes to dev.2 forward slash API forward slash articles. And so this is just the dev API right here. And so if we go to this, we'll see we're just going to get a bunch of JSON out with articles. Cassie Williams, who you were just talking about earlier. And the way that we are able to query this with GraphQL is through this custom at rest directive. And this one, you know, single line of code right here, it's it's so concise and it's doing so much for you. I know Lucia, you just, you and I have been on this very long experiment of like, how would we implement something steps in like in other uh, GraphQL tools? And so how would you do this with say Apollo? Well, you'd have to, write resolvers and and then do that for every query um, instead of <laughs> this the single line of code that, code that you uh, that you tap on and there's there's a lot more that goes into it too as far as maintaining in the long run but just um, sheer lines of code and, and what you'd have to learn besides GraphQL um, in order to implement this it, it's definitely a lot more yeah when you say write resolvers basically what that means is you have to take this output and then you have to take this query and write javascript code to turn that query into something that the api understands and the way you do that is basically just by like writing tons of functions of like you get this object and you destructure it out and then you do this and then you map over right here and then you take the result of the thing you mapped and then you put it over here and it's just like this huge long complicated thing and that is what's being done for you with steps and is has already figured out how to do that mapping. And it basically like keeps the resolvers kind of hidden away from you. So you don't need to really think about it. And you just basically input the, you figure out the types. So you look at the schema and you're like, okay, I have a type of, and that's a string. I have ID and title string. And then you can have, you know, tag list as an array and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And then you, write the the query name that you want to call it and then that's you just feed it in the the endpoint and you can do kind of more complicated things as well you can like rename fields so that you can have queries be slightly different from what you're actually going to get so if you want to say if you have like a couple different schemas that all have like similar kind of naming schemes you want to make it a little more comprehensible for your front end team you can make the queries a little nicer so it's let you really think about the query first and what you want the query to look like and work backwards from there and this is really what the whole promise of graphql was in the beginning is that it was meant to be a very nice mental model for front end developers because it allows the front end developers to specify exactly what they want what data they need without having to have the back end team create all these different bespoke endpoints to give that specific okay. data that they need. It just exposes the entire graph and says, here's what we got. You tell us what data we need in a really concise, simple syntax, and then we'll give you that data back. And then you just get a big data object. And if you're on a front end project, you would basically do like a fetch call and you'd send this whole query over and then the response back would be this data object and then you would do data dot google natural language and analyze sentiment dot document sentiment dot score and then there it is and that's the thing and then you can take that and you can just put it in your ui and you can do whatever you want with it right and it's very introspectable which is like the advantage from the back end devs perspective or at least one of them so. mm -hmm. yeah it's really great just being able to like a see representation of the data yeah, being able to see the whole schema, being able to see the documentation and be able to just go in and say, okay, like, what is this type that I'm getting and what are the different types on? You can see how it's you know, kind of, you have nested types within types and it's uh, very easy to see the whole thing and what's happening with it. Now, there's a couple other things happening here for the studio that's pretty cool. So we also get is you get this endpoint right here. And so this is now like a graphical editor that is connected to a live endpoint that we can use to query as well. So if we take the same query and pop it in over here. Then you gotta also put the, the secret in. Yeah, pop off to do that. Yeah, because this is a, the one thing that makes streaming this kind of stuff a little challenging is because you usually will be working with some sort of API key 
when you're doing this because we're having kind of like two levels of authentication going on here. There's going to be the authentication happening through the API itself and then the authentication. And that's the like the the keys for Google Natural Language and then the keys for Dev.2. But then you're also going to have keys for your step zen endpoint. So when you get an endpoint deployed, then you get uh, API keys as well there. Okay. So what I did is if we were to lift this up in query variables, we just have like a, a little object that has Google natural language colon and then my key right there. And then that key gets fed in as a query variable through here. And then this is now our uh, response. Yeah. But what if we wanted to modify this? Well, if we wanted to add extra, uh, you know, things like the sequence at sequence, this is what you can do with step ten is you have the at sequence directive, which lets you feed the output from one response into the query of another. So what's going to happen here is we're going to write a new query and this query is going to be get comment sentiment. And mm -hmm. for this one, we're going to have the get comments by article ID query and then the get natural language analyze sentiment. And so we have both of these queries and then you kind of define the steps, how many queries you have is how many steps you have. And yeah. then the arguments, what it does is it takes the field of get comments by article ID, which is going to be body HTML, and then it feeds it into the content for get natural language analyze sentiment. Because if we look at this schema, then we need to input the content. And then if we look at uh, this one, then we need to get the body HTML here. So the way you can do that is you are able to just quickly take the schemas that you have and just export them into a new project. So I'm going to download this and I'm going to hop off again so that I can right. get my keys and set up. I'm good. Meanwhile, Cal Shake says, can you send the links to these docs on derivatives? I believe that um, they mean directives uh, and I will grab that. So here's the blog post. I think I already posted that one, but um, I can yeah. drop the sequence directive as well. So we've got a couple docs on how to use this. And then I have another example also that's um, using the Sunrise API. So what this one does is it kind of takes um, pieces from different APIs to kind of find like your location and then feed your location in to get your weather and then figure out your time and then like do all that to, to say like you are going to have like the sun's going to rise at this time in wherever you live. So there's a couple links there. And... Close some of these tabs. Okay. Okay. So now we've got this project over here. And so we've got our Dev2 schema and then our cloud natural language scheme over here. And you see that also gives you the, the docs and kind of the explanation of these queries. It also gives you those sample queries that we were looking at before. And then if we were to start this up on step and start, this is our kind of CLI, like kind of dashboard type thing. And this is going to show you a similar uh, graphical editor to what you were looking at before. And yeah. if we want to say, grab those same queries that we were doing before, we can do that. So now we're getting that back. And then if we wanted to pull these queries, I was using another project where I took the, the prefix off, which is all I keep 
renaming these. So we're seeing that we're still getting back the the same thing that we were getting before. But um, there's actually one thing that is slightly different, which is kind of nice, which is that we no longer have the the secret part in these um, Google natural language queries because the right. key management is being done for you through your your config.yaml. So your your queries here are a little more concise. And so that's why generally I like to, once I'm ready to, to uh, begin a project, I'm glad that I've got the account so because it makes key management a lot easier. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and then let's go ahead and take a look at this sequence query. So if you want to add things into your project, you can do one of two things. You can take this query and just drop it in one of these schemas you already have made. But um, what I did is I created another file called sequences.graphql. And then you go to your index.graphql file. And then this is where it's taking all those different schemas and combining them together into one unified graph. So this is one thing that you'll have to know about if you're transitioning from the studio to a project is that as you add in more files and more schemas, you need to make sure you always include it in your index.graphql. So here we have two directories, you have a dev.2 and then Google natural language, and then contained within those directories are the schema files, .graphql files. And then I dropped sequences .graphql just in the, the root of the project. So there is no directory prefixing it. And then we're gonna take this whole thing right here and then save. And then when you save, you will have your endpoint will be automatically updated and redeployed. And we have this localhost 5001, but the endpoint itself is not running on localhost. This is something that confuses people a lot when they start out is that the endpoint itself is running on this down here or this output on your terminal. Uh, Pleasanton is my account name. It'll, yours will be slightly different. And then it'll have dot steps in dot net. And then the name of whatever you gave it when you configured your project. So you can either create this stepsend.config.json or when you first run steps in star, if this doesn't exist, it'll say, hey, what do you want your endpoint to be called? And then you'll just input that. Okay, so let me actually show which comments those are. So I'm inputting an ID for comments from one of my blog posts, someone said, thanks for sharing, Anthony. Someone said, hey, Anthony, what a great piece of tutorial you are writing. Would you like to write for me? I thought this is pretty versus like advertising in my comments, which I thought was pretty funny. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to do this get comment sentiment query, which will take the body.html that is being output here and then input it as the content for the Google natural language. So if we take that, that and now we're getting 0.7 so positive score because the comments were positive and that makes sense and then i had one in my example that was one of my like more like opinion pieces less of like a, a technical kind of article and so for that one let's check, check this out it got um negative four so this one the I was, I was saying how you can find out whether like how spicy was your your blog post. So this one was a little too spicy. Here. All right. So this is pretty cool. And it shows you how with C at sequence, it's really easy to just like take the output of one thing you feed into another. And with the Google natural language API, especially this is like really, really powerful because all of the queries that we were doing, they all have just this like content thing that is the, the argument input for Google. And so all you really have to do is take a, a query and then figure out what the output is that you need to feed into it. And then that's the only thing you really need to change in this, in these sequence things. So now we're taking another one where we're going to get the description of the article and then we're gonna feed it in to analyze the entities. So this is similar to what I was showing before in the, the beginning, but now we're going to be actually linking the two together. So we have analyze entities 
And this is another one of my pulls. And so this was the, the Redwood API one again. And so if we wanted to then do, oh yeah, yeah, that's it. So that's get article entities. So that is feeding in the, the description of the blog post into the get article entities and then outputting the, the name and the salience. So yeah, this is basically showing how easy it is to really connect these APIs together and kind of feed one into the other. And if you just think about like any, any API is going to output usually like text and words at, at some point in time, either that or like numbers that you can kind of analyze. So I really like the kind of generality of this in this setup, because if you wanted to take out dev and just put in tweets instead, that'd be really easy. Actually, we have a, a combination pack for that already, but if you wanted to do like Yelp reviews, or if you wanted to do mm -hmm. like what's some other things you could do, you could, or even like a uh, GitHub, you know, like GitHub issues or, or, or GitHub discussions now, like GitHub discussions is becoming a really big thing. And GitHub has its own, you know, huge, massive GraphQL APIs. They're one of the first public GraphQL APIs ever actually. Right. So there's just, there's so much data out there in the world, but it's not always obvious <laughs> what you, how you can, leverage this data to like gain insight unless you're right. like you know a machine learning expert or a data scientist and you're someone who's right. been using r and python and all of this stuff whereas like if you're a front developer and you've used like graphql before like you'll get graphql and it'll be pretty easy and now we're kind of giving you this tool that's like hey you can leverage this graphql knowledge you have to start doing like really complex data science and analysis yeah. on your on your data just throw it in a github action maybe even and yeah, totally. Yeah, you could have like uh, automation. So you could have things like this. You can have these queries like run on a, on a schedule and stuff like that. And so you can do all sorts of workflows. And that is uh, kind of the main stuff that I wanted to show. Um, do you have any uh, comments or questions? And anyone in the chat, feel free to drop some comments. Thank you for the people who are hanging out. Appreciate you being here. Um. Yeah, you could almost combine our two projects, right? Because they both have Dev2. And then you could like build out a blogging platform that had sentiment analysis and dynamic data pulled in from different different sources. That could be fun. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't right, be very two, hard. Two, like two ways kind of that we've seen in these workshops so far to use APIs. One is to, um, I mean, they they both return data, but one kind of like returns content and then the other can return information to you about your content. So mm -hmm. um, leveraging both of those can make a really powerful website. Yeah, yeah, and it's definitely, because it's GraphQL also, it's very easy to hook it into a front end. So if you wanted to use, you know, you can use React or Vue or Svelte or just vanilla JavaScript and then create a front end that's going to take those exact same GraphQL queries and then run them through a fetch call or something like that. And then you can also create just like input forms and buttons. So you could input that data as well, the same way we were exactly. through the through the editor. So if you wanted to take this back end and then build it out to a full site, as long as you've worked with GraphQL before, it's it's really easy. Even if you haven't worked with GraphQL before, you'll be able to pick it up pretty quickly. Because I mean, both me and Lucia yeah. are still fairly, you know, newer junior devs really coming up from right. previous careers and we both really took to GraphQL, I think, because of the simplicity of the mental model and the ease of use yeah. and the developer tooling around it and, and all that kind of stuff. So it so was more like really... unlearning than than having mm. to learn a bunch of new things. Yeah. No, it, yeah, it's totally true. Because it's like it can't be this easy. Like this, like we're cheating, right? It can't. It can't be this easy. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm not sure if we have any current workshops scheduled for the immediate future, but we are like, this is a regular series and keep an eye on the, the steps and Twitter and things like that. If you, if you enjoy this and want to see more, I'll go ahead and get some links in there for you all. Our Twitter is steps underscore dev. And then we are uh, just www.stepsin.com, the usual. And yeah, feel free to reach out to either me or Lucia. We're happy to answer questions. We're both very active on social media and we love talking about this stuff. So always happy to chat with anyone, help you get spun up. 
Yes. And then that studio that we showed is at www.grabql.stepson.com. Just putting that in the chat too. No www. Oh, just grab QL. Cool. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, Kel Shakes, please uh, let us know um, once you check it out, what you think. We appreciate it. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.